Yes, I'm a professor of astrophysics here at UC Davis. Some people call me a rocket scientist. Often they say, oh, you must be smart. Really? Well, maybe, but today I'm going to tell every one of you that you are all smart, and hopefully I'm going to show you that each and every one of you can be an astrophysicist. So how does one become one? I could start my story with saying, when I was seven years old, I was watching stars with my dad, and I told him back then, I'm going to be an astrophysicist. But I won't. Rather, I'm going to start my story with a struggle that I had many times throughout my career, which is how do you answer your, the question, why am I doing this? And why would somebody pay billions of dollars for me to do this? And the answer to the first question is very simple. The reason why I'm doing this is because I'm really, really excited about and I want to learn about things we don't know. There are many things we don't know in our lives. For example, why does the economy crash? Why do we sleep? Why do woodpeckers not get a concussion when they hit a tree with 100 Gs? <laughs> well, actually, scratch that one out. A UC Davis professor won an Ig Nobel Prize explaining why exactly there is. <laughs> but there is a lot of things that we still don't know. And one of the main things we don't know is things about our universe. So you, me, the air we breathe, this earth, stars, galaxies, all the chemical elements you learned about in your chemistry class, only make up about 5% of the entire universe. 5%, that's nothing. And for centuries, we thought this is all there is. But in the last couple of de decades, we realized, no, this is not all there is. There is a lot of stuff we don't know. In fact, 95% of the universe is what we know very little about. So this is like, for centuries, we thought we are studying the whole universe, so we thought we are studying the cow, but quickly we realized that all we studied was its tail. <laughs> now, here at UC Davis, we know that's not enough. And so that's why I study dark side of the universe. But how do you see something that's dark? Here it is. <laughs> I'm using equations of general relativity formulated by Albert Einstein. Scary, huh? Start writing them down. They're going to be on your exam. <laughs> Just kidding. So when I first saw these equations, I was scared to death about them. Just like when I was a little girl, I was st scared to death for, uh, about the drill. It made horrible noises, I had no idea what it does, and so I was scared until Billy came along. Tall and handsome Billy. <laughs> Billy from Sweden with all its 100,000 screws. And at that point, me and the drill became the best friends ever. And the same was true with the equations of general relativity. Once I realized what they're good for, I have learned to love them. And I'll try to do the same with you tonight. Okay, so how do they work? So the those very ugly equations are telling us that if the light is traveling on a straight path between a galaxy that you see on the left and a Hubble Space Telescope, you will see the galaxy where it's originally located. This is just like if somebody shines with a torchlight on you, you know where the person is standing. Turns out if you put a big massive structure in between, the light does not go on a straight path anymore, rather it goes on this curved path. And so you don't see the galaxy where it was originally located, rather you see the galaxy from in the direction where the light is coming from, up there. And so, the same is true for the light coming in the bottom. So you get multiple images of the same source. And you can get four images, two images, you can get entire rings. A Little bit clearer? The more mass there is, the further apart those images are. And so we can measure the matter in the universe even though we don't see it. Better? Well, if you're still uncomfortable with that, I'll make you more comfortable. Unfortunately, we are not going to take the wine, neither we are going to take the top of the glass. We are going to take the stem of the glass to demonstrate this gravitational lensing effect. 
And so next time you're at a party, go look for a candle and try to look at the candle through the stem of the wine glass. And you can see on the top right, the four images of the same source. The fourth one is hidden behind the stem. On the bo bottom left, you can see the entire ring forming. On the bottom right, you see the two images of the same candle. And it doesn't look like a candle. And the same is happening in the universe. So we have a galaxy, a blue galaxy, for example, that's being lensed by a yellow galaxy. And we get the very same combination of images in the universe. So the blue galaxy is being lensed by the red galaxy, and we can tell the mass of those galaxies. And so now I'm going to apply this gravitational lensing effect to a very special cluster of galaxies. And so what you see here is not just one galaxy, but thousands of galaxies doing lenses, lensing. And so all these orange galaxies that you see on this Hubble Space Telescope image belong to the same galaxy cluster. They're a bit difficult to see for the untrained eye. I'm going to help you. These are the two clumps of galaxies, uh, two galaxy clusters, each containing a couple hundred galaxies um, that we see. And so what was remarkable, when we first saw this image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, what was remarkable about it is that not only one galaxy clusters, but two of them. But that wasn't enough. The real surprise came when we took Chandra Space Telescope image, and we imaged the same cluster with, um, we imaged the gas in this same cluster. And so here it is. What we immediately realized when we saw these images is that the two clusters have collided. We are witnessing here the most energetic event since the Big Bang. It was a huge collision, and so the galaxies have a lot of space between them, and they go straight through. But the gas is turning and churning and bouncing off each other, and so it's slowing down. And in addition, you can see this characteristic bullet-type shape, which gave the cluster the name, the bullet cluster. So we knew we had a collision of two galaxy clusters going on here. And so we can see all the regular matter in this picture. But the question was, what did dark matter do? And so for that, we apply now our gravitational lensing tool and image the dark matter, and it's showing here in blue. And this was remarkable. The reason why it was remarkable is because we realized dark matter exists and also because we realized that it acts unlike any matter we've seen here on Earth. Unlike gas, dark matter just goes straight through, like ghost particles. If I was dark matter and walked through the wall on the side of this auditorium, I would go straight through. No problems whatsoever. And the same is happening with dark matter. Really bizarre. And the reason why we are so confident is going, to show, is going to be shown in this movie. You can see the two colliding masses. The red is the gas, and the blue is the dark matter particles. And as they collide, you can see this is a computer simulation. You can see that the gas is doing a lot of action, whereas dark matter goes straight through. And what is incredible about this is that this simple simulation is matching our observations really well. So we are quite confident that we understand our nature. So dark matter exists, and it doesn't interact. It's very antisocial. <laughs> does not talk to each other, does not talk to the regular matter. And so the conclusion is, most of the universe cannot even be bothered to interact with you. <laughs> I'm sorry. But dark matter is important, and the reason why it's important is because it's also governing the past and the future of our universe. How does this work? Imagine me having a rock in my hand and throwing it up in the air. It's going to come back down because the Earth is pulling back on the rock. If I throw it harder, it will take a bit longer, but it will still get down. If I throw it really, 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 really hard, it's still going to come down. But if I put it on a rocket, it's going to leave our Earth. 
So the same is true with dark matter and the other component of our universe, the dark energy. So dark matter is pulling the universe together. And so it's causing it to collapse. Whereas dark energy is pushing it apart. And so once we figure out how much dark matter and dark energy there is, we can predict what is going to happen with our universe and what has happened with our universe in the past. So let's first look, instead of pressing play, I'm going to press rewind. And we are going to go really, really fast in the, our universe's past. Really, really fast. All the way back to the Big Bang, which happened 30.8 billion years ago. And this is a really long time. Imagine Big Bang happening on January 1st. We are now at TEDx UC Davis, December 31st. Our galaxy on this timeline appears on April 1st. No joke. Our solar system appears on August 31st. And Homo sapiens appear 20 seconds before the midnight. The Times Square ball is two-thirds down the pole when the Homo sapiens appear for the first time. And so we figure out what the past has been, uh, what the past of our universe is. But we also know what the future is. With all the research, we know that from now on, the universe is going to expand forever. And the astronomical research, we, in astronomical research, we have figured this out less than a second before the midnight. So it's not, now it's not time to pause. Now it's really the time to press play, go out and explore. The reason why I'm doing why I'm, what I'm doing is because it's exciting, because I care about it, because there is a lot of things to discover. Even though most of the universe is dark, I still care to play with it. But the reason why everybody else should be doing this is because in less than a second before midnight, we have discovered many wonderful things. Your cell phone camera is a result of astronomical research. Wi-Fi, internet, all this, and what the universe is made of, what is going to happen with the universe in the future, we have figured out in less than one second before the midnight. So go out and play, be a rocket scientist, because the, best, um, because the best things are waiting for us where we least expect them. Thank you very much.